Thank you, Julia. And I'd like to also welcome everyone to this webinar this afternoon. Uh, no one on this webinar, I think, needs reminding of the importance of the recent election in the US. In fact, it's defining character. And it is also hardly news that a US election of this scope and importance impacts the entire world. And in a way, no area is more impacted than Latin America. Uh, what we're going to do in this webinar is a little different than many of the analysis that have taken place about the election. There has been no shortage of discussion, and we are in the midst of very uncharted territory. Uh, but this afternoon, we're going to examine two intertwined themes, the forces that shaped the outcome of the US elections in November, the issues, but in particular, the influence of Latino voters on the election. And we're going to take that analysis and weave it together with the implications of the elections for the US to be sure, but also for the countries of Latin America. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, at the, the group of people that we have today, all of them have a long relationship with the Center for Latin American Studies at Berkeley. Uh, let me introduce them and then I'll briefly go over our format. Uh, Maria Echeveste has built a very distinguished uh, career as a public policy consultant, a lecturer at Berkeley, a longtime community uh, leader, and the former White House Deputy Chief of Staff during the second Clinton administration. Uh, she is currently the president and CEO of the Opportunity Institute. Uh, she has been an important voice on issues related to immigration, to the Latino vote, and to a whole host of other critical issues and she is a senior scholar at the Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, Danielle Coronel uh, is, I'm gonna, uh, a, an award-winning Colombian investigative journalist. Uh, he has been a courageous writer uh, uh, and television producer in Colombia and is now the president for news for Univision in the United States. He has been editor in chief of the Colombian national newscast Noticias Uno, NTC Noticias and Noticias RCN. And he has been a visiting professor for two years uh, at the Center for Latin American Studies at UC Berkeley and very much a part of this community. Uh, and finally, uh, my colleague, Paul Pearson, who is the John Gross Professor of Political Science at UC Berkeley. Uh, his teaching and research include American politics, public policy, comparative political economy, and social theory. His most recent book, Let Them Eat Tweets, uh, could not be a better backdrop for this period now between the election and the inauguration uh, that we are going through today. Uh, and Paul has also been a very important part of the class community. I'm sorry to report that the fourth person who very much wanted to be with us tonight, Denise Dresser, uh, was taken ill at the last moment in Mexico we will miss her presence this afternoon, but look forward to hear her appearing in future webinars that we do. Uh, our format will be straightforward. We are first going to have each of the presenters uh, give a brief introduction about a dimension of the election. Then we will have a conversation about some of the issues raised and then go to the questions that you have sent in in advance and those that come in over the question and answer uh, during the webinar. 
And finally, we will have a brief summation uh, of each of uh, our three uh, uh, participants in the opening right at the end of the webinar. Uh, so with that, uh, oh, before we do that, uh, there's one other thing that has become a bit of a, a tradition for us. Uh, we welcome uh, the international participants of this webinar from Mexico, Prague, Hungary, uh, Colombia, Canada, London, Germany, and The Hague. We also welcome people from across the United States, including Wisconsin, Nevada, Texas, Atlanta, Seattle, Washington, DC, Illinois, New Orleans, uh, and Florida. Uh, so with that, uh, let me turn it over uh, to Maria Echeveste. Wow, thank you, Harley, and it's a wonderful, oops, wonderful to, um, to be on this panel on a Friday afternoon that yet again, uh, as we read the newspapers or watch the news feeds, uh, reflects um, continuing drama in the United States. Um, the question of when is President Trump going to concede? When is the transition going to start as someone who has participated in the Clinton transition um, from Bush uh, senior in 92, 93, but also the handoff in 2001 uh, from Clinton to Bush uh, junior. Uh, this is an incredibly stressful time on top of everything else. So I wanted actually to, to make three points um, and then talk a little bit about what I think it means for the Americas. First off, as many have noted, the expected blue wave of Democrats winning in the United States, gaining seats in the House, perhaps taking control of the Senate, did not materialize. Indeed, um, by final, you know, the most recent counts, 73 million people voted for President Trump. And almost 80 million people voted for Biden. But the fact that this election was much closer than pollsters and experts anticipated, and it wasn't just Democrats who were um, wishing, um, there was candid expectations on the Republican side that there were, they were going to lose seats in the House, that they could lose the Senate. Um, that this divide, the fact that this is so close is something that we really, I think, um, as speaking as an American, really have to understand. Now, I think when you look a little closer, for Biden to win Michigan so decisively, 150,000 votes, um, to win Pennsylvania, not by that large a margin, but still significant, um, but still lose Ohio, which was always going to be hard always gonna be hard, but still, um, to me reveals that the anxieties of the working middle class, especially in the Rust Belt, uh, continues to be a motivating factor. And I say to my colleagues and friends um, who are, um, shall we say, center left, um, that not all of the 73 million people who voted for Trump are uh, white supremacists or racists. Um, I don't know what percentage of that base of Trump supporters subscribe to that kind of ideology, but I cannot, I do not believe that all 73 million do. Um, but some percentage, I think, whether it's 25, 30 million people who voted for Trump, I believe voted for Trump because of that anxiety, because they saw downward mobility for themselves or for their children. And those anxieties, you know, in the same way that Tip O'Neill, the former Speaker of the House, once said that all politics are local, in some ways, all politics ultimately are about me and my family, right? And there's some sense, I think, I, I'm looking forward to all the political scientists analyzing um, the votes and, um, and interviewing voters to help explain um, what motivated, especially Trump voters, to vote for Trump 
um, and how their economic anxieties and their anxieties about the future uh, played in. Just one data point. I recently heard that some initial analysis is that um, many Trump voters voted because the econ voted for him because the economy was number one issue on their mind. And, and some of that explains why Latino voters in places like the Rio Grande Valley of Texas um, and elsewhere in Nevada might have voted for Trump is this concern about the economy. Whereas the majority of Democratic who, voters who voted for Biden voted because of the pandemic and their concerns about the lack of a national effort to counter the pandemic. So I, I want to just that the, the closeness of that of this election uh, means we have a lot of work to understanding and unpacking what motivated, especially that high high number of voters for Trump, and that leads me to the increase. Lots of stories immediately uh, after the election about the increase in Latino voters, especially Latino males, as well as African American males voting for Trump. And I, I have to say that it was amusing to me that um, finally columnists across and commentators across TV and newspapers were going, Latinos are diverse. They are not a monolith. I've only spent 25 years personally trying to educate political actors, candidates and operatives about the diversity in our community, that the majority of Hispanics in the United States do not speak Spanish. They, I, Spencer, uh, Daniel, they do not watch Univision for their news. Um, so uh, the fact that for even this campaign gauged its invest, Biden's campaign gauged its um, investment or measured its investment in the Latino community by the amount of money it spent in Spanish language advertising, notwithstanding what I just said, um, tells you that there still is a tremendous amount of, uh, shall I say, expertise in campaigns um, about the diversity of, of Hispanics, Latinos, and we can't even decide what to call ourselves here in the United States. But I do think that understanding um, the vote in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, of Texas um, is important. Um, for those of us who have been working on Hispanic voting, trying to increase Latino voting, who have been waiting for decades for Texas to turn blue, We've all, many, I was born in Texas, but I grew up in California, so I feel I can say with some authority that the Mexican American in Texas is different from the Mexican American in California. And unless you understand those differences, um, you, you see the numbers that came out of the Rio Grande Valley. I, I think for so many of the advisors, uh, this was true in the 2016 campaign. One of the reasons I had issues with um, Hillary Clinton's campaign outreach to Latinos is the issue isn't just immigration. Um, because we are so diverse, because we're generationally diverse, linguistically, racially, ethnically, um, I totally understand why a message focused on immigration in South Texas would not resonate. They are dealing with the in your face issues of um, migration and illegal migration, but also it's a very poor area um, of the country and the economy is, is not um, at all promising. And so, and then you also have the growth of evangelicals in the Hispanic community. So understanding the politics and the issues of each, each community, each, shall we say, city, town, county, um, that requires a level of sophistication that, that um, shall I say, national presidential campaigns or senatorial campaigns they are willing to spend the resources to try to understand the white swing voter 
and and have not spent made the investment to understand the complexity complexity of the Hispanic voter. And I will simply say that uh, one lesson that that needs to be taken from this election is that Hispanics are the new swing voter. That demography is not destiny. And if Democrats think simply because Latinos are increasing in number in the United States in places like Georgia, which by the way, Latinos voted in Georgia and probably helped get Biden get across the finish line. I'll let Daniel talk about Florida. Um, but I think that this lesson about the complexity of the Latino voter is, is really, if Democrats don't learn it, uh, we, will lose, we will lose elections. And lastly, let me say, and I hope we can have this conversation about what does it mean for the Americas? Again, going to the Rust Belt. What Biden does in terms of trade and manufacturing and really focusing on the economy, that will uh, impact what happens in the 2022 uh, midterm elections, especially in that Midwest area. I will say that Biden has to be ready for a surge in illegal immigration, not just because of the expectation that he will reverse some of Trump's policies, but look at the continuing impact of climate change and the hurricanes that continue to batter Central America. Um, having been in the White House when Hurricane Mitch hit Central America and anticipating that there would be an increase in migration, um, this administration, incoming administration, has to be ready to, to show both control of the borders, but also more um, hum humanitarian and humanistic approaches to this um, ever-challenging um, problem. And then lastly, and I've heard uh, President-elect Biden speak about this, is that part of the answer to dealing with migration has to do with real investment in building the institutions in the sending countries. Um, I will stop by saying that it, that it may be hard for us to tell other countries to obey and build institutions that focus on the rule of law, uh, the rule of law when um, our current president refuses to accept the results of a properly conducted election. And so I, I'm anxious to think about what happens when we try to build institutions of law and elections and anti-corruption given the last four years of the Trump administration. So let me stop there. Um, and I really look forward to, to the discussion from uh, panelists and from, from you as well. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, why don't you continue? Well, thank you, Harley. These panels are usually about the tremendous consequence of the presidential election in the United States for Latin America. Today, I would like to propose an exercise in reverse. It's hard to imagine how negatively Latin American political issues or politiqueria, as we say it in Latin America, influence the presidential campaign here in the United States. Donald Trump's government has been a blessing for several so-called Latin American strongmen of questionable reputation. In Honduras, for instance, President Juan Orlando Hernandez, identified as a co-conspirator in a drug traffic and trial against his brother. The president of El Salvador, Najib Bukele, who has put uh, an end to their already weak system of checks and balance and of his country and his character, but his attacks to the independence of the uh, judicial branch and, and to be a predator of the, of the freedom of press. Guatemalan president Alejandro Yamatei, who received Trump's support and help in order to expel uh, the CICIC, the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, which was the only source of independent information during many years of corruption in that country. In addition, Trump has support, strongly support, for the former president of Colombia, Álvaro Uribe. And I'm going to talk to you about that next. 
because Uribe paradoxically was a key person uh, for the election in Florida. Much of the dirty propaganda against President, uh, President elect Joe Biden came from South America and specifically from Colombia. This propaganda identified without any vices Biden and Vice President Harris with the so called Castro Chavismo. And it, it was promoted in Florida by politicians of the Colombian right is left. There are also indications that Colombian top diplomatic officials participate in this campaign. That dirty, that dirty propaganda was aimed at influencing the decision of Cuban, Venezuelan, and Colombian voters who could and did tip up the balance in the crucial state of Florida. In particular, Miami-Dade County gave an additional 200,000 Hispanic votes to President Trump, which is half of what was needed to win Florida. If Trump uh, had lost Florida, it would have been clear of that night that, that, uh, that he had lost the election. Winning Florida had definitive value for Trump. Without it, his chances for winning were close to none. The dirty propaganda that identified Biden with Maduro and the late Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez uh, is part of old fashioned political strategy used in Colombia against judges, uh, political opponents, and journalists. This strategy is so effective that it has been reproduced by the right wing of every Latin American country uh, uh, in, the, in the last campaigns. And even traveled to Spain and was present during the last election. Uh, uh, Castro Chavismo was a, a main character in the, in the Spaniard last election. It consists of promoting fear of the so-called 21st century socialism. Anyone is not a member of the right wing is according to this propaganda, a promoter of communism. So uh, now I want to tell you who is the creator of that dirty strategy that is so successful in several countries in which made a strong debut in the American presidential campaign. Is the former Colombian president, Alvaro Uribe, who was also living very distressing personal circumstances during this election. Uribe, who was the president of Colombia between uh, 2002 and 2010, and without question, still being the most influential and powerful politician in this South American country, faced many judicial processes for his alleged links with paramilitary dead squads, but one in particular got him in trouble recently. This is a case for alleged briberies of witness and obstruction of justice. Uribe, who was senator until a few weeks ago, was subject to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of Colombia. The court uh, filed criminal charges against him and ordered house arrest, all while the presidential campaign was unfolding in the United States. Soon, Uribe and his party began a national and international campaign to try to discredit the Supreme Court that accused him. Uribe, who is a sort of tropical Trump, soon asked the United States government for help. Although Uribe was serving time in his ranch, which is 200 times bigger than the White House with its annexes and gardens, just he present itself as subject and victims of cruel imprisonment in, in, in a terrible jail. When Uribe resigned his status as senator, the Supreme Court lost its jurisdiction to process him. He was therefore released and Although the investigation continues, he was under the orders of the Colombian Attorney General, who is a member of his political party. Trump 
celebrators Uribe's release in a tweet message, which I read that as follows. Quote, congratulations to former president Alvaro Uribe, a hero, former recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom and ally of our country in the fight against Castro Chavism. I will always stand with our Colombian friends, close quote. And the government of Colombia, along with the powerful politician related to Uribe, dedicated uh, uh, themselves to, to, to uh, support and to make campaign for Trump, especially in the state of Florida. Colombia therefore broke with 40 years of diplomatic tradition that maintain a clear and balanced relationship with both Democrats and Republicans to interfere for the first time in the US presidential campaign in favor of Trump. It, this is, of course, a shameful for my country and is, and is unhappily, uh, it will have consequence in the relationship with the United States. This is the issue I would like to put on the table for discussion. The paradoxical influence of a cheap propaganda from the Colombian right trend of the election of the world's largest democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, and now we'll conclude with Paul Pearson. Well, those are, those are tough acts uh, to follow and it, um, it's made more challenging by the fact that I, when I looked at the title for this um, session and focusing on the implications for the Americas of the election, I thought, well, I'm a, I'm a complete amateur when it comes to thinking about um, a foreign policy and uh, Latin America in, in particular. So I, I kind of wondered what my contribution to this would be um, and uh, decided that what might be most helpful would be for me to focus on the following question, which is what kind of government uh, is Latin America likely to be dealing with uh, in the aftermath of the election? Um, and of course, there are immediate question marks about that because um, we don't know what's going to happen in the Senate. Um, we don't, I think we do know that Donald Trump won't be president on January 20th, uh, but exactly how uh, this a quite unsettling, quite disturbing uh, dynamic that set in after the election will play out. Uh, you know, there is uncertainty about that. Um, but we, we know, I think already, we know quite a bit, uh, even though uh, what we know, I think, is actually a reason for pretty deep concern uh, for any country hoping to have sort of a stable negotiating partner uh, in, in the United States. And, you know, as Maria's comments were suggesting, if, there, if there's hope uh, that the United States will be in a position to sort of think long term uh, and make some investments that would contribute to prosperity and stability throughout the Western Hemisphere. I think there's a lot of reason um, uh, to be pessimistic about the prospects for that. Um, so let me just say a little bit about why, why I would say that. And I'll start with a very simple statistic, basic statistic. Um, there are far more Republican senators right now who have tested positive for COVID uh, than who have acknowledged that Joe Biden is the president elect in the United States. That's really astonishing um, that um, the, the unwillingness of you know, the folks who are supposed to be the most responsible, you know, elder states persons uh, in the US um, are are, are either cheering on or mostly just staying silent um, as um, the sitting president challenges with not a shred of evidence and you know invoking ridiculous conspiracy theories um, the idea that the, that the election has been stolen with him and we should be very I think we should be very concerned I don't think this is just like theater to to um, salt you know to soothe his ego. Um, it reflects the nature of the contemporary Republican Party. Um, some of the kinds of dynamics that, that Danielle was was pointing to, um, in you know, in sort of cross national uh, perspective about what what is going on in the right uh, and the way um, the kinds of incentives that it creates. Um, and there there are three things that I would just emphasize about the structure that we find ourselves in 
in the aftermath of um, the election that Maria, I think, described really well. Um, uh, the journalist Ron Brownstein had a phrase for this that I liked. He, he referred to it as the Antietam election. Um, so that's a famous and bloody American Civil War battle in which both sides threw all their resources um, at the cost of tens of thousands of lives uh, into a single day battle that ended up in a stale, stalemate that resolved nothing. Uh, and that, I think, now, of course, the election did resolve some things, right? It resolved who is going to hold the presidency. Uh, it, it, it will resolve uh, who is going to be in, in a majority in the very powerful U.S. Senate. Um, but I think there were, but, it, but in terms of the long-term uh, bitter conflict in an increasingly polarized society, um, at, at a time when I think some people thought there was going to be a bit of a resolution. There was going to be a blue wave, as Maria said, that was going to mark a repudiation of the Trump administration. That did not happen. Right? Um, and it did not happen uh, because I think the main reason why it did not happen, or at least a, a simple descriptive way to talk about why it didn't happen, was because it turned out that Donald Trump could generate a lot of votes. Right? This is the highest turnout election uh, in 100 years, over 100 years in the United States. Uh, people came out to vote against him and people came out to vote for him. Um, and the polls were wrong because they underestimated how many people were gonna come out and vote for him. Right. And we could parse like which exact constituencies that we're talking about. Um, but I think, and, and there are interesting things to say about that, but, but I think actually um, what, it, what it suggests more than anything else was that the supply of white working class, college, non-college educated, more rural voters, voters away from where prosperity is being generated in the United States, there was still an untapped reservoir of those voters. And they came out. And they made this election uh, pretty close, even though you know, the Democrats were able to turn out, uh, were able to turn out their people too. Um, so what does that mean going forward? Well, it means for Republicans that they recognize that the base of the party is now thoroughly Trumpian, right? Um, no politician who wants to be reelected is going to look at that turnout and think, gee, what I need to do is really confront Donald Trump, right? They are not gonna, and that is, I think, a big reason why you see the kind of silence that you see among, uh, among political elites is that they recognize um, that it would produce civil war within the party uh, to do that, or more likely it would just, it would end their political careers. So, um, so the fact that Trump has been able to show that he could really deliver those voters to the polls, not enough to get him over the top, uh, but enough to actually give a huge boost to other Republicans all the way down to state legislative race, races, that's a big new fact uh, on the political right. The second structural reason is because the forces of organized outrage uh, that Jacob Hacker and I tried to describe in our last book, and that's everything from right-wing media uh, to um, the leaders of the evangelical movement to groups like the National Rifle Association, um, elements of police unions, right? um, they have no incentive to turn down the heat. Right? Um, on the contrary. They have every organizational incentive to keep the heat up. Uh, it's profitable, right? And I think that is not to be underestimated. It is enormously profitable for the people who excel uh, in that business of stoking outrage. And organizationally, these groups face their greatest threat uh, from people who are even more extreme than they are. Uh, if they show any inclination to moderate, compromise, so on. Third structural factor, and we know this from the 2009 election, right, is uh, that for Republicans facing a new Democratic president, confrontation and obstruction pay. It is beneficial for them in terms of their nor near, near term, short term, narrowly partisan goals, it is beneficial for them. So when Mitch McConnell said famously or infamously, 
that his top priority was to make Barack Obama a one-term president, that was actually rational from the point of view of maximizing his party's share of political power. And it paid off in 2010 uh, with a sweeping political victory. So whether he'll say it in public or not, there is no, I have no doubt that Mitch McConnell is currently thinking that his top priority is to make Joe Biden a one-term president. Um, so no cooperation, no bipartisanship, um, no politics stops at the water's edge. Uh, you are going to see the same kind of, you're going to see more Antietam style politics uh, coming from the conservative movement. Um, and the fact that this continues to go on and has reached such a level of intensity is just deeply alarming to anybody who cares about uh, the political stability of the United States. Um, we have step-by-step step got into a point where a president clearly defeated in an election can be screaming and millions of people believe it um, and none of his co-partisans will question it, um, screaming that the election has been stolen from him. Um, that is very dangerous stuff and I see no reason to think that it's likely to stop soon. Thank you, Paul. These, uh, I think, were three very thoughtful and important presentations. Uh, and I'd like to begin with a brief comment on each of the three, and then ask the presenters if they had any questions for the other members of the panel. Uh, Maria, you began with a discussion of diversity, that is the diversity of the Latino elect, uh, electorate, not simply in seeking to reach them, that for sure, uh, but also in the various backgrounds, geographies, and issues that are critical for them. Uh, and then uh, you spoke about, you, you put it very, I think, directly, that there is a lot of work unpacking and understanding the character of the Trump vote. Positively, it's not simply white racism. It's far more complex and that understanding may be key to going forward. One small example of that in a county that's pivotal, uh, Macomb County, Michigan, third most populous county in the swing state, just north of Detroit, Trump carried it by 40,000 votes in 2016. And in this recent election in 2020, he carried it by 40,000 votes again. Does that mean this is a base of white supremacy? Not by a long shot. White supremacy is certainly there, uh, but not necessarily defining at the same time voters were voting in Macomb County for Donald Trump. Many of them voted for a very progressive second term uh, Congressman, Andy Levin, uh, uh, a, a Democrat who has been very forthright on a range of issues. That understanding and unpacking is central. Danielle, as you know, there's been a lot of attention in this country about the role of Russia in interfering in the US election or the role of China or reportedly the role of Iran. Uh, but you are raising something that is critical and has received a lot less attention. The role of Latin American governments, uh, uh, it really putting disinformation in a targeted and effective way and in a way that sharply influences the election. I think that is a critical dimension of it. And I think Florida is a state that we haven't begun to understand on a national level. And that contribution, among, among the other important points you raised, I think is important and missing. Uh, and Paul, you raised the issue right at the beginning. Uh, what impact 
will the Biden government have for Latin America? And then you put that in the context of the nature of this recent election. Uh, you brought out points right at the end uh, that one lesson of 2009, beginning in 2009, is obstructionism pays. What may appear as a bizarre death march, in fact, pays politically. Uh, and uh, standing up to that, if you're a Republican, has very high cost. That dilemma, I think, is also very much worth putting in the mix. So with that said, uh, uh, does any panelist have a question they'd like to ask before we uh, go to the questions from other participants? I'll start. And it's a, actually a question for both Paul and Danielle. You know, given this very deep divide that, that uh, we're recognizing and, and setting, and assuming as, as we say, I think um, Harley's point about Macomb County, not all of those 40,000 votes that gave, that went to Trump were all white supremacists. So there's, there's, so the question I have is, is there something that the Biden administration should do intentionally and proactively to try to rebuild that sense of common purpose? You know, Columbia had, you know, had the, I can't remember the full name, but sort of re reconciliation, trying to, you know, because of the war, you know, that process of understanding and, and coming to terms and reaching peace. Now we haven't had a civil war yet in this country this time, but it feels like we're on the brink of it. So should we have some sort of effort to bring us together uh, or is that just a pipe dream? Well, my experience in the look for the common purposes is, is a little bit paradoxically, because uh, for instance, in my country, uh, we have the clear conclusion that meanwhile, the war is able to unify the country, the peace is a division factor for the country. It's a paradox, but it's true. And, and probably is not an exclusive uh, political phenomenon in Latin America or in Colombia. But in Israel, it looks pretty similar. So Ehud Barak was a war hero in the Six Day War, and he uh, consolidated a, 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 a candidacy uh, uh, around him because of, of, of he was a hawk for the, for the war against the, the Arab League and, and specifically the, the Lebanon. But when he arrived and tried to, to make a peace process with the Palestinian, he looks like a weak figure and the society divide because of that. Same in Colombia. So just yesterday, we saw Rudo Giuli Rudy Giuliani deep in sweet and hair color, uh, pretended that Trump had lost the election because ballots were counted using machines which were made in Venezuela. As we know, that is completely false. But, but in the midst of this propaganda machine and in the field of the social media, there will be many who believe it. So we need, we need to work in order to create a, a critical thinking in most of the people in order to differentiate between information and propaganda and between serious, serious statement and, and that ridiculous theories or, or uh, conspiration theories that is the daily bread for many Americans and for many people in the world. We are, we are, we are living in, in, a, in a very particular situation because you know, we have created a world in social media that pretend to be a human being perfectly co connected with the rest of the, of the world, but 
in the practice, in the, in the daily life, is the contrary. We, we decide who follow, who unfollow, who like, who dislike. And this is a factor of isolation and disinformation. And that is completely contrary on the reason. If you, if you look for information in order to confirm your, your standpoint or, or even worse, your prejudice respect to the rest of the people or the different people, you are living far and far of the real circumstances, but you reinforce your, your own position. That's, that's the, the disgrace of the, of the uh, daily life in these particular times. Um, so I'll, I'll say one thing about the question and then I have a, actually have a question for Maria. Um, so, um, I mean, it's, so it's remarkable to me. I spent um, most of my professional life involved in conversations comparing the United States uh, with, you know, the, the universe of rich democracies, mostly Western Europe and Canada and Australia and Japan, places like that, you know, and the kind of the problems, the problems and challenges of stable, prosperous democracies. And now I find myself talking with people and um, about democratic backsliding and authoritarianism and coups and reconciliation committees, you know, and uh, you know problems that we historically didn't associate with the United States, um, but I think are, you know, we we should recognize there's a reason those conversations are changing, and it it reveals just how fraught and dangerous our politics has become. It's a little hard. I mean. It's a little hard for me to imagine Biden being able to really effectively lead such a conversation uh, at the moment. I'm sure he will try, um, but I feel like we are in of that conflict. Um, you know that um, that those kinds of efforts uh, often come uh, when you know one side has triumphed, um, and they're looking back. Um, you know, maybe with some attempt at repair. Um, and bringing people back in, um, but we're just not. Maybe, maybe such a thing could have happened if there had been a blue wave election, if there had been a really, really clear repudiation. But I, you know, I just don't think I just don't think that's where the country is, unfortunately. Um, so, so my question was about um, the Latino vote um, and your comments about the Latino vote, which I thought were super interesting. Um, and uh, it's clear, it seems clearly right, both, both of your comments, that it, is, it just does not make sense to lump all these voters and potential voters together um, and think there's like one frame for that, right? Um, so that seems totally right. And it, it clearly seems like Democrats who were disappointed by the results uh, need, to, um, uh, need to do a lot of serious rethinking. Um, but so, and here's the quest, the question part: um, Is there a danger that we bend the stick too far the other way? Um, so, if I see a group that is growing in the electorate in leaps and bounds, I would rather be on the side that is getting something like 65% of that vote than the side that is getting 35% of that vote, right? So, um, you know, there's a big story to be told. You know, there's a huge story to be told about the Southwest. Uh, in you know, there are now eight senators elected from the Southwest in the United States. They are all Democrats. I'm not counting Texas as part of the Southwest here. They are all <laughs> Democrats, right? That is astonishing, right? So, um, so I guess that's. I just wonder if there's a danger here um, of of overinterpreting these results um, and um, and not recognizing. Clearly, demography is not destiny, and you got to fight for every vote. Um, but I think on this issue, I certainly would rather be on the Democrat side um, than the Republican side. Yeah, well, I would say two things. One is um, there was a question in the Q and A about sort of, well, how can you um, sort of tailor approaches given the diversity when the U.S. government lumps, you know, Hispanic and tries right, and 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 so. I, uh, I think that, yes, it's easier to lump a group together, um, but if anybody digs a little deeper, we know that um, uh, 
Caribbean immigrants, Black um, Caribbean immigrants to the U.S. have a different approach to a number of issues than native-born African Americans, right? It has something to do with the immigrant mentality, et cetera. So if we're willing, my point is simply that if we're willing to invest in trying to understand that swing voter, that suburban mom, that soccer mom kind of, which usually, by the way, as a former soccer mom, but usually they were not trying to talk to me, they were talking to white soccer moms, um, that, would, that, the, that candidates and parties, uh, especially the Democratic Party, should, should make an effort to invest. I mean, we spent so much money in this cycle, right? And I would like to ask, where's the infrastructure? Where, what are we building for for 2022? But I think the re, I think you're right about maybe the reconciliation idea is is too early because there was not a definitive victory. Um, and but because of my campaign experience over the years, there people want the same things. They they really do. They really really do. I mean, if you pay. pay they, and this is true in, in Latin America. It is true. Most people, they want good jobs. They want safe neighborhoods. They want good schools. They want a decent retirement. They want health care, right? So I, the, what, the thing I would say about this election, and maybe I'm just Pollyannish and optimist, which is unlike other countries where the divisions are deep, they these did not break wholly on racial, ethnic, religious lines. This is not Northern Ireland, Protestant versus Catholic. This is not Rwanda, Tutsi versus Hutu, or Muslim versus Hindu. And so I think if there were, and I guess I really believe that there should be an effort to try to find that common ground, but maybe maybe in the second, maybe in Harris's first term, because right now you're right, McConnell's just gonna dig in his heels and we have to be, we Democrats have to stop trying to always be the moderate, nice person. We, we, got, we got to fight too. <laughs> uh, any other questions, Danielle? Yes, I, I would like uh, uh, to share a comment with a question for both sure. Marie and Paul. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a very interesting uh, county in Texas, Zapata County. 95 of the population is Hispanic. They have voted Democrat for the last 100 years. But this Zapata County, this time, vote for Trump. Most of them are, 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 are very liberal people, if you consider uh, uh, from the from the uh, uh, laboral rights and for for their claims, and at the same time, the evolution that they have had in the perception of the difference gender is 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 very special. But they vote for Trump. Why? Probably because the main source of employment in the area is the oil industry, and industry so they 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 probably decide because of the of the statement of of uh, uh, candidate biden in the second debate and it 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 reinforced uh, the the maria's theory that is there is not a simple reality we hispanics are not homogeneous group we are we are very diverse with 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 a lot of layers uh, of layers of decision, we are we are uh, uh, we bring our own prejudice from our countries. There are a lot of uh, racist uh, um, factors in our countries. There is a terrible discrimination in our countries, uh, uh, we are uh, the reflex of of, of that. So I, I believe strongly that, that each generation is a little bit better than the previous, than the previous one. But, but, but we live, uh, uh, we have the, the baggage of, of our education and our 
society uh, problems and prejudice and thus uh, uh, emerge in, in all the election. But particular Zapata County uh, vote for Trump, which is your interpretation. Uh, I, I, I would like to, to, to hear both of, of you, but, but Marie is very interesting because it's your hometown. In, in <laughs> well, I was born down in Harlingen. <laughs> oh, let me, yeah, but so I did a quick sort of Google to look at Zapata County, and I think it's really interesting because, you know, you alluded to um, Hispanics own sort of issues with race and color, et cetera. Well, Zapata County is a small county in terms of people. It's, you know, at 15 to 20,000 people. And what's interesting is that, uh, the racial makeup of the county is 85% um, white and 85% of the population is Hispanic, which can be of any race. And therein lies something that I have always tried to educate my fellow political operatives is that about 50% of Hispanics also check the box white. So to to, as my colleague at the UC Berkeley School of Law, Ian Haney Lopez has said, it's, you, there, you can't just use race, if you will, or ethnic identity as a motivating factor when there's such diversity in a group. Um, and I think, and especially if it's an oil county, of you know, the economy and talking about climate change and reducing dependence on fossil fuel, those are jobs, right? So that goes back to the question, I think, of or of the importance of the motivating factor of what what will be good for me and my family. That seems to be the first thing that people vote on um, if if they don't have other information or have other understanding about. Well, actually, you know, you care about immigration. Well, then you need to care about climate change because if you think you have migration issues now, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you just wait as this climate crisis gets worse. <laughs> Paul, do you want to comment? It's super interesting. I know nothing about Zapata County, I, 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 but I, I, I will just say this: Look, if if you got a county where you know that's overwhelmingly economically dependent on oil production they're going to vote for republicans <laughs> you know they just are um and i you know for the reasons that maria was just describing and i and i you know i think that's to be expected um and um you know there are problems with the electoral college should show up here right where we have to care about you know we have to care about ethanol production in iowa for stupid reasons and we you know, people were worried about fracking in Pennsylvania, you know, but, but, you know, I think climate change is, is clearly evolving in a direct, you know, there's just a clear divide between the parties. And so if your local economy is dependent upon extracting the extraction of fossil fuels, it's pretty clear what party you should vote for. And, but that's not true for most people in the country, you know, so I think climate change, I, you know, as I was saying before, I'd rather be on the Democrat side um, on, on that issue, even if it even if it hurt them in that county. Uh, one brief comment on this, Maria, uh, on what you said. Uh, uh, race obviously is important. Ethnicity is critical, but it comes down in so many ways to how it affects you and your family. And to understand that, that was brought home to me. From Michigan, who's a former president. United Auto Workers, he said race is important, but you have to have class involved in the mix too. And what class means is how is you, how are you and your family impacted uh, by many of these economic changes? Uh, with that said, we're going to go to the questions that we've received. This one uh, just came in, uh, and it starts with climate change, not as something in the future right now. This is from Sochil, and it is climate change is going to be one of the main triggers of migration uh, from Central America. And it is going to uh, increase exponentially in the next years. The traditional Mexican solidarity for refugees from this area, political and or environmental, 
has been painfully reduced. How do you see the federal, federal response of the Biden administration and also the ones of border states, California in particular, to mitigate so much suffering of this humanitarian crisis? Do you want me to take that? Or, sure. Uh, um, I I want to first to like really stress. Look, I, I I was joking when I said you haven't seen anything yet on migration, but what I really want to say is like migration is an issue to be managed. You are never going to eliminate the movement of people. That is the human spirit. There are people. There'll be a group of people who will stay in a war torn country and an area and just accept their lot. But there will be a chunk of people who will say, I'm not going to starve here. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting, I'm moving, right? So our job is, I think, as civilized countries, civilized society, is to develop standards and implement standards that allow us to manage our borders. Every country has a right to determine who comes in and on, on what terms and for how long. But how do we manage the movement of people that is grounded in basic human rights? And, and I, I think an initial thing would be to really work with the Mexican government to provide assistance and resources so that people seeking asylum are not, are not treated in the way they're being treated and treated as, as, as without any rights. That, that just offends all basic sense values of, of, of how you treat another human being. Now, does that mean that you don't have ICE detention centers? You know, everybody talked about defund the police, but originally it was, you know, um, get rid of ICE. Um, and that also, those of us in the immigration world, well, that's not gonna be very helpful to win uh, votes. Um, so finding, I think there is a way for the Biden administration to, to thread that needle about managing the border. And it starts very simply, something that everyone was upset with is like, you do not take children away from their parents. That has to stop. Okay, but then happens, oh, what are you going to do with that family? And where are you going to house them? And, but we have technology. You know, would you rather be in a nice detention center where your child can No, you can have ankle bracelets. And my civil liberties friends may, be a, may object to that, but that is a much more humanitarian response than having you be in a detention center. So I think there are things we can do, but it's, it's, it's going to be met with a lot of criticism from the left and from the right. But you know what? That's the challenge of governing. Uh, unfortunately, we're running tight on time. Uh, so I'm going to combine three questions uh, for Danielle, and then we will do concluding remarks beginning with Paul. Uh, so Danielle, these are the three questions. Uh, the first is from Beatriz. Can you describe the Hispanic population in Florida? What are some of the key differences? Then Bonnie asks, and this is quite related, how many Colombians live in Florida in, think, in terms of thinking about how much a factor they were in having Florida go for Trump? And the final part of the question for Danielle is from Anonymous. If Latin American politicians have been supporting Trump, do you think they are now going to turn their back to Biden's policies regarding Latinos in the US? First, the, the Hispanic population in Florida is very diverse because uh, it's completely different in South Florida than Central Florida, for instance. In, 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 in Central Florida, there is a, a big nucleus of population from uh, uh, Puerto Rico. We, they, are, they are very political active and very involved in the campaigns. Four years ago, they decided 
uh, uh, that they didn't vote for for Hillary Clinton because uh, apparently they have some reserves about the Clinton's administration respect to the to to the Puerto Rico uh, uh, bankruptcy and they they didn't vote for Trump but they simply didn't vote uh, in the South Florida there is there is a, a, a mix of population that a predominant of Cuban population the 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 second the second group is is a little bit complex because it's Central American Puerto Ricans Venezuelans and Colombians but the Cuban the Cuban nucleus is the efficient cause of most of the political local activity so they are they are very active in the local radio in the local tv and most of them most of the of the people that is in control of the local uh, communication is uh, very uh, active in the anti castro and they this they they think sincerely that Fidel Castro is still being the axis of the war. Uh, no matter he passed away a few years ago, they consider that that from the from somewhere <laughs> up and down, he's 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 all the time on control of everything in politics. And this is the the the, the perfect circumstance for the propaganda against Castro Chavismo, because a couple of groups, uh, Venezuelans, who uh, they didn't have a long tradition for immigrants. Why? Because Venezuela was the rich guy in the in the poor neighborhood. So they 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 uh, on the contrary, they received a lot of immigration, including Colombia, of of, of most of Colombians. And, and the, the experience to be immigrants is new for most of Venezuelans here. And the domestic discussion and, and, and the domestic issues about the, the Maduro's regime, about the tyrannic reactions of Maduro against the population, transfer to the Florida in order to support Cuban uh, May axis of the of the political. At the same time, uh, Colombians, Colombians, uh, there there are less than two hundred thousand Colombians in 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 Miami. Probably uh, half or one hundred twenty thousand have the the the, the uh, uh, are citizens and and vote in in the election. I the the. The number is not clear. We are we are waiting for the results of the census, but basically the the, the Colombian uh, in uh, political field is very polarized, very divided between between Uribe and against Uribe. And for most of these Cuban and Venezuelan guys in Florida, Uribe has been the paladin against Chavez. So they perceive a completely unidimensional analysis about the Andean politics. And as Uribe is the champion against Chavez and against Maduro, Uribe is our guy. In despite of everything related with human rights, corruption that involves Uribe. So, that's, that has been the axis of, of some discussion that, that, that in this uh, unidimensional uh, understanding of the, of, of the Latin American policy is the same lens that they appreciate the American politics. And this elimination of the complexity is, is the cause of, the, of, 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 of that kind of decision. And uh, 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 um, President Trump took advantage of that in order to present as the uh, as the friend 
of the people who is fighting against Castro Chavism in Latin America. And uh, uh, this, is, this, is, this not represent the internal political opinion in Colombia. That represent a, 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 a very powerful group, but is, is something that, that Trump, but, but there. So uh, probably uh, uh, there, is, there was not a president as informed about Latin American issues as Joe Biden. Why? Because since Biden was a member of the Judiciary Committee, of the International Committee in the Senate, he was involved in many things related with, with, with Latin America and South America. He knows with details about Plan Colombia, which has been the terminal for, for Colombia in the last 20 years. He, he was in, in, involved uh, as senator and then as vice president in the negotiation of the application. He, he participated as senator in many uh, discrete and public labors in order to protect people who defended human rights in Colombia. I know that. Uh, in a few months before that, that you and, and, and the class and UC Berkeley received me with generosity in order to protect my family and myself of the threats in Colombia because of my journalism, uh, we received a support letter signed for a few American legislators. Between them, among them, Barack Obama and Joe Biden. So I know that, that, that he was a, a, a more sophisticated perception of Colombia than Trump's, for instance. And I, I believe that he uh, will be able to understand in a multidimensional uh, uh, standpoint our reality, which is very complex. Thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, and now uh, we will go, just beginning the discussion, we will nonetheless go to our very brief concluding remarks, beginning with Paul, then Danielle, then Maria. Okay, I'm gonna be really quick because I realize we're, uh, we're running over time. Um, and so I, I just wanna make one point in closing about American politics that draws on what Danielle um, was just saying in a way. and relates to something Maria was saying earlier, which was, you know, we are not Northern Ireland. Um, uh, we, are, um, uh, we are not Hutus and Tutsis um, at this point. Um, and I think it's very important to realize that and to realize that, yes, broadly, most Americans want a lot of the same things. I think that is a very important message to underscore. Um, but we are traveling down a road of being transformed into us versus them. Right. Um, and Donald Trump has excelled at that. Um, and it is, it is a project that really, I think the political right has been engaged in in the United States uh, for the last, at least since Newt Gingrich, um, but, but probably before even that. Um, and so it is, and that is very, very dangerous, right? Um, when you get to the point where you sand off all the other things where there are possibilities for different connections among people and you're left with, which team are you on, right? Are you for Trump or against him? As being the only question, that's a dangerous society to live in. So we all need to be doing whatever we can um, to try to unwind that a little bit, um, to try to, um, while standing up for the things that we believe in, to try to reach across the lines that are getting hardened to try to figure out um, how to explore those commonalities and bring them more to the fore. Uh, and even if you can only reach a few people that way, those people can reach other people, which is very important, right? Um, you know, people actually hear much better when they're hearing people who they think are from their own community. Um, so at, at this really dangerous time, we need to be doing whatever we can to try to soften some of those edges and, um, and play up the commonalities. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, 
I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I, the, the best ideas is when I close the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Trump is not the cause. Trump is a consequence. We are living in a very wide world because of the disinformation and the fake news. Probably as a self-criticism against the journalism, we are a new mission. Journalists now also have the challenge to try to teach the people to be more critical of what they read and so and so and see in social media. I I I have an adorable neighbor, uh, an older lady, who asked me the other day if it's true that Democrats are leading this country toward communism. It's, it's, it's incredible because it, she's an educated person and, and, and is convinced because of the propaganda. A friend also asked me this week, is, is was the truth that Biden will allow abortions to, at nine months? When I say it was not true, that we was going uh, to make abortion mandatory to which, so I I I saw I, I knew that it was a lost case, and I replied that he shouldn't work because if he did, he couldn't do it retroactively. So <laughs> uh, 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 we live in the middle of this terrible campaign of disinformation, and we need to try in order to increase the judgment of the common people in order to make best decisions. And the, the problem no, is not strictly between Republicans and, Liber and, 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 and Democrats or, 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 or between right or left, it's between the truth and the people who take advantage of the lies. And that's very complicated because it's not only in the political field, it's a universal problem that we have to deal with. Thank you. Uh, Maria, we'll conclude with you. I'll be brief. I just, I think um, both of what Paul and Danielle said are absolutely important. Um, how we fight the propaganda, how do we focus on truth and evidence and have a common set of facts that we can then build um, common approaches to problems that are confronting our communities, our states, our country, the world. Um, I, I, um, I, I agree with Paul that, and I believe some of the science reflects that there is this almost instinctive human nature way of quickly categorizing us versus them and we will look for something that distinguishes. So I will conclude by saying that I think at least for this country, one area that I feel I may have to spend more time on is uh, the idea of national service, where you bring um, everyone together for a year, year and a half, from different backgrounds, rural, race, et cetera, class, and have a common purpose to help you recognize that, in, at least in the, we're all Americans. That's what the military did so much when it was draft. Um, and I think that maybe some sort of national service to build that sense of a common purpose out of many one may be an important strategy for dealing with this divide at that, that frankly, has been used for political purposes for power. And that's naked reality. That is what has been, what it's been used for. Uh, and it doesn't benefit the majority of Americans witness people are about to lose all their unemployment benefits the day after Christmas, because we can't get Republicans and Democrats to work together. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Harley. Thank you. Very brief concluding remarks. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the class staff who did an exceptional job putting this together as most of the things they do. Uh, I'd like to wish Denise Dresser a speedy recovery. We look forward to hearing her voice on future webinars. I'd like to thank the interpreters uh, who uh, did, I think, an excellent job uh, through, through this material. 
Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank all the participants from around the United States and around the world. We very much look forward to you being at future class webinars. So have a good evening.